Okay, so we're going to talk next about the preferences of the household and then also the uh, production function of the firm. So we're going to assume that household utility, again, household utility, is given by the following relationship. Okay. So uh, there's lots of different parts here, but they're the kind of parts you've seen in other economics models. So we have a utility function, which depends only on consumption, standard economics assumption, uh, for better or worse. All right. And then we have the number of people in the household. Okay. So, um, I should be careful here. So um, LT is not the number of people in the household, it's the number of people in the economy. So how many are in each household? It's gonna be the number of people in the economy divided by the number of households, okay? So each person in the household gets utility U of CT, and then we have LT divided by H, people in the household. So if we think about the total amount of utility generated by the household at any moment, it's the product of these two terms, the utility per person times the number of people. Okay. Now we're going to think about, we're sitting here at time zero. We're going to think about the total amount, the total stream of utility that will be generated forever um, for this household. Um, the person at time zero is going to discount utility uh, with this rate, the rate rho is like the level of impatience or how much you dislike future people. So the larger is rho, the less I care about future people and the more I care about um, people at time zero relative to those future people, okay? So we just have the stream of utility, a flow utility generated at each moment. We're summing that up from zero to infinity, but then we're also discounting to say that we care less about utility flows in the future. And how much less do we care? That's given by this rho term. Now, one thing to mention about, uh, about economics models is that there's a normative side of them and there's a positive side of them. So this discounting makes a lot of sense from the positive side. So what does positive mean? Positive means description of the world. Okay, so it turns out that people tend to uh, care more about things that are in the present than things that are in the future. So to give you a typical example, if I said, uh, would you rather go to a de dentist appointment this afternoon, or would you rather go to a dentist appointment in one month? Many people don't like going to the dentist, and they would say, well, I'd rather go in a month. Okay. Um, from a positive standpoint, therefore, this sort of discounting makes a lot of sense. From a normative standpoint, what is normative about? It's about should. Okay, so should we care less about future people than present people? Or should we care less about the future than the present? Or, you know, should I delay my dentist appointment? Um, you know, it will be just as uncomfortable for me in one month as it will be for me this afternoon. So do I have some moral reason to actually delay it? Okay. And that all sounds kind of like pie in the sky stuff. Uh, you know, who cares? Uh, but it actually tends to really matter, especially when you start talking about things like climate change, um, where many of the harms are, or many of the worst harms are in the future. Um, but people in the present need to think about how much they want to sacrifice to prevent potentially harms in the future. Okay, so there's actually a quite a famous discussion about what level this row should be set at um, in the context of climate change. Uh, there was like some report in the late 2000s, I'm blanking on the name, it's uh, affiliated with the Nobel Prize winner, uh, William Nordhaus a few years ago. Um, but anyway, uh, I believe that they think that this row actually should be set to zero, um, which means that we care equally about 
one person in a hundred years versus one person today. Okay. So that's like the normative row. In this class, we, we should be thinking about, say, the positive row. Okay. So this is describing how people actually behave, not how they should behave. How's that for a tangent? Anyhow, continuing on. <clears throat> I'm not going to say too much about this slide because it's actually the identical slide from the solo growth model. It's exactly the same slide. I just copied it. So uh, we're going to assume that firm's production function is going to be constant returns to scale. Excuse me. And we're going to assume that we can, well, not really assume, but we're going to often write this production function in its intensive form, that is physical output per unit of human capital, or alternatively, physical capital per unit of human capital. Okay, and then recall that we can, so, you know, we can kind of summarize that by little y is equal to little f of little k. We're going to make these assumptions the same ones, what I call the Yanata conditions about the, uh, the production function. So we're going to assume that if you have no physical capital, you have no production. We're going to assume that there's decreasing returns, you know, again, to explain the same way I did last time, fixing the amount of human capital. If we increase the amount of physical capital, there's decreasing returns, which means we're always going to get more production if we put in more physical capital, but fixing the amount of human capital, uh, every marginal unit of physical capital is gonna give us a little bit less oomph, a little bit less extra production, okay? Um, and then finally, for that technical reasons, because we want to guarantee that an equilibrium exists, we're going to assume that uh, the slope of the production function is infinity, when we get close to zero. Okay, and we're gonna assume that the slope, oops, it's here. And then the slope of the production function is going to get flat, uh, or it's gonna approach being flat as we get off to infinity, okay? If you have an economics model, you're gonna have an objective function. So we talked about the household's utility function uh, we also want to write out the constraint. Okay, so what is the household constrained by? Why can't they just choose infinite consumption? Well, there's going to be a household budget constraint. So in words, we're gonna, I'm, going to I'm going to present the actual constraint to the next couple of slides, but let me start here with uh, a description in words. We want the present value of the household's lifetime consumption to be less than or equal to the present value of the household's lifetime income plus whatever amount of wealth the household starts out with, okay? So what is the trick? The reason why this isn't something that's trivial to write out is because the interest rate is gonna change over time, okay? Depending on how much capital there is in the economy relative to labor, uh, you know, capital can grow, it can, it can fall, little k can change over time, depending on where we start. Um, the interest rate, actually, the price or the rate of return on, on capital um, is going to change over time. I should be a little bit careful here. Um, there's, uh, we're, gonna, we're going to assume that savings are all saved in capital. So like investment and savings are the flip side of the same coin. So, um, you know, from the household's perspective, what it's doing is choosing how much to save. Um, that can be positive, that can be negative. It's going to, it's going to depend on the interest rate. It could borrow, it could save. Um, from the sort of economy's perspective, we're gonna assume that when households have positive savings, that's like a positive level of physical capital. Okay, so savings is in a sense, just investment. Um, and investment is converted into capital one for one. So what is the interest rate that the household is facing? That's why I'm going to sometimes use the term interest rate and rate of return uh, interchangeably here. You know, rate of return is like if I, uh, if I loan out some capital to a firm, you know, how much capital do they give me back? 
uh, interest rate formally is, you know, if I have a, if I have a certain amount of savings, then how much savings or how much will I get in return in the next period? They're very close, you can, as you can see by my description there, but that's why I'm using these two terms interchangeably. Um, so what's the trick? Interest rate changes over time. So we're going to sort of write the, if we want to think about the interest rate that a, that a household is facing um, at time t. So at time zero, they save a certain amount of money, say x, you know, uh, let's call it x zero. So the household saves a certain amount of, of money x zero at time zero. How much money will they have at time t? Well, it's going to be this object. So it's continuous interest, but now we're going to have this e to the power rt. Okay. Um, and this is not the same as what you've seen. Probably in the past, you've seen something that looks similar. I'll write that out here. In the past, you may have seen something that looks like this. Okay, this is kind of your standard continuous interest rate uh, formula for when you have continuous, uh, um, yeah, continuous, uh, I, I'm missing the, uh, the word here, but when, the, uh, when you have uh, a continuous rate of, uh, of interest, uh, like what you'd get at the standard. Um, you know, many banks have updated their interests this, this way. Um, so anyway, this is kind of the standard formula on the bottom. Ah, it's tripping over myself now. This is the standard formula. But now we're going to have a slightly different formula. Why do we have this RT? Well, we're not assuming that this little r here is constant over time. We're going to assume that that can change um, as the economy changes. Okay, so at every instant, you actually get a different instantaneous instant uh, interest rate. How can we think about this? Well, I think it's kind of helpful to imagine uh, first thinking about how, what you'd get if we just had sort of units of time. So suppose that, you know, we just had one interest rate, let's call it R0, for the first period of time delta t. Then we had another, in, and then, you know, so after delta t, we would have a certain amount of money. And then we're going to update that because we're going to have another interest rate, R1, say, for the next period. And then we can, now this is multiplying, you know, we can keep going. Let's put a little multiplication sign. Well, I've got an X, so that'll make it look confusing. We could have R2 times delta t dot, 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 and then maybe the last period will have rn times delta t. All right, we can rewrite that using the properties of the exponential function as e to the power r0 delta t. Oh, actually, let's even take that delta t out. r0 plus r1 plus dot, 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 rn plus times delta t. All right, now imagine making this delta t smaller and smaller. Okay, so this n would be growing. You know, eventually what we're going to get is just an instantaneous instant rate. So we're going to have, instead of delta t, we're going to have dt, an infinitesimally small delta t. And then we could write this as x0 times e to the power from 0 to t r of tau delta tau. Okay. So what I'm doing here is, in a sense, giving you a very informal derivation of this formula over here. Okay. So just using our notation, then it's x0 e to the power big R of t. Okay. So that's why our interest rate kind of looks like that with an informal derivation. So let me stop there, and then I'll continue in the next video.